experience. Uh, youth choir practice at 5 o'clock today, and uh, those involved in that skit uh, will be practicing that this afternoon, but can everybody go for lunch and come back? You know, we'll be involved in that. Just go eat your lunch and come back uh, an hour, hour, 15 minutes after we break uh, service, which we should be out of here by 2 o'clock anyway. So. Amen. We'll have a practice run through all that this afternoon, and then, like I said, youth choir uh, five o'clock this afternoon. Uh, don't forget, next Sunday we'll be our we'll have our Christmas dinner here at the church, and uh, y'all coordinate with uh, Mrs. Johnson who's bringing what, so we don't have uh, fifteen pots of beans and nothing else. Okay? Um, I could make a big pot of beans and cornbread. I like it myself. Sunday, we'll have morning service, and we'll come back in here for a short service. Probably be no preaching, I'm not guaranteeing that at the moment, but probably not. Just some singing, some Christmas carols, testifying about the love of God. Amen. Why he came, why he come for you. Amen. And uh, that is the end of breaking going home for the day. All right, let's go to Job, chapter 11. Job, chapter 11. I think I mentioned the other night I could only think of one man in the Bible that does sin was the truth too, but actually there's two. Job's not one of them. It's uh, uh, no. Uh, Samuel didn't raise his kid right. Daniel. Oh, Daniel. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you said Samuel. Uh, I knew it wasn't Samuel, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Daniel's ill, and you're right. Thank you. Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11. Verse 13. If thou prepare thine heart. He said in verse 12, Vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's coat. And that's what it, where everybody's born and born sinners. But if thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thine hands toward him, toward God, if iniquity be in thine heart, put it far away, and let thy wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then, if you do that, shalt thou lift up thy face without spot, yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear. Because thou shalt forget thy misery, and remember it as waters that pass away. And thine age shall be clearer than the noonday. Thou shalt uh, shine forth. Thou shalt be as the morning, and thou shalt be secure, because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt make thy rest in safety. Also thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. Uh, yea, many shall make, the, make suit unto thee. But the eyes of the wicked shall fail, and they shall not escape. And their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. Father, we come to you again, and thank you for your goodness. Lord, we pray again for Little Dalton, that this, this is really not uh, as serious as it could be. Pray God that doctors will be able to find out through their test exactly what his uh, situation is and know how to uh, address that issue. Lord, as we go through the message here, I pray you speak to our hearts. And God, we who are saved, we just want to thank you for that rich salvation you gave us through Jesus. And anyone not saved, may they see how desperately they need that salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, verses uh, 13 through 17 is a picture of salvation here. You turn to the Lord, verse 13. You repent of your sin, verse 14. You're saved, verse 15. And from that point on, you're secure in the Lord, verses 18 and 19. You secure Jesus for all eternity. Jesus said, uh, Hebrews 13, verse 5, to the saints of God, He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake me. He said in uh, John chapter 6, verse 38, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise and cast out. Now, uh, what was this? Wednesday night, last Wednesday night, I think I was talking about security to believer. And I'm going to take that a bit further tonight and deal with it from a, a today and deal with it from a particular uh, standpoint. Our security in the Lord, we who are saved, our security lies in the question, has God provided salvation eternally for us, uh, or has he just provided a testing ground, a temporary situation, a chance for salvation once you die, 
and then it's too late, by the way. But uh, that's the question. Has he given you a chance for salvation, the people who accept the Lord as their Savior, or has he given you eternal salvation? Do we contribute anything to our salvation, or is it solely of God alone? Uh, and by the way, these people that say, hold out to the end, you can forget that. You can hang that up. You can hold out to the end and wake up in hell. You better make sure before the end gets here. Amen. And I'm not so uh, keen on these deathbed confessions either. Because I've seen people not on the deathbed, but I've seen them confess and quote, get saved because they got caught in trouble. You know, every prisoner, just about every prisoner in the, in the prisons is, is uh, it's not his fault he's there. He's got caught. Uh, and that's the way it is with a lot of People, when they get caught in their sin, they go through the motions of getting saved, and it's not really, repentance is not really from the heart, so they don't really get saved when it's in situations like that. Now, what I'm going to deal with this morning is the fact that the Trinity, so what's that? That's God. The Godhead, God manifests himself in three different ways to humanity, and each way has a particular purpose, but it's still God manifesting himself to us. And, and everything God does, you find the Trinity involved in it. God the Son, or God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three involved in everything that God does. And it's just as true in the matter of salvation as anything else. So we're just going to look at what, how the Trinity is involved in our salvation for a few minutes this morning. Let me say, first of all, salvation is the work of God the Father. It is the work of God the Father. They asked Jesus in John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29, they said, what must we do uh, that we might work the works of God? And his answer was, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. He said, the only work you're going to do is believe on the one that God sent, which was the one talking to him, the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe on him whom God the Father hath sent. That's the work of God. The work of God was sending his son to die in our place. So salvation is the work of God the Father. God's purpose for saving us is basic to the security of our salvation. Ephesians 1 verse 4, he said, According as he hath chosen us in him, as God the Father hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He chose us to be holy. He chose us to be without blame. And he chose us, he was to tend to bring us unto glory unto himself. So if one son, if one child of God gets lost or is lost, then God's purpose in salvation is totally overthrown and defeated. If only one person loses it. John 18 verse 9, of them which thou givest me, Jesus said to the Father, of them which thou givest me, I have lost none. I thank God that he gave me to Jesus and he hadn't lost me. And he gave you to Jesus if you're saved and he hasn't lost you. So his purpose for saving us is, is foundational to our security. God has the power not only to save but to keep us saved. And you don't have the power to save yourself and you don't have the power to keep yourself saved. And uh, the psalmist says no man has power to keep alive his own soul. Uh, it's in the hands of God. All souls belong to me, God said. John 10, verses 28 and 29, he said, I give unto them eternal life. Aren't you glad it's a gift? Absolutely. I didn't have to pay for it, didn't have to bargain for it, didn't have to buy it, didn't have to do anything, didn't have to trade anything at all. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave uh, them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. There has to be one stronger than God to get you out of God's hand. Amen. He has power to save, power to keep. The promise of God is basic to our security. Everybody in here probably could quote John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him, here comes the promise, should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's a, that's a basic to our security. He's promised negatively that we won't perish. He's promised positively that we have everlasting life. Titus 1 verse 2 says, God that cannot lie hath promised to, unto us eternal Amen. life. Amen. In chapter 6, we looked at that last uh, Wednesday night. He talks about the uh, two immutable things, the oath of God and the promise of God concerning our salvation. And he said, uh, he said this gives us a, a hope. Uh, we have an anchor uh, in our soul which goeth into the holy of holies unto the mercy seat where the blood is applied. So God uh, has us secure 
based on his promise to us. If God broke his promise to one Christian, God would be a what? Liar. Liar. But God that cannot lie. In fact, it says God is not a man that he should lie. All men are liars, but God is not. The love of God also guarantees our security. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, matches John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Romans 5, 8, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us us. His love guarantees our security. The pardon of God guarantees our security. Ephesians 4.32 says God for Christ's sake hath past tense forgiven you. He didn't forgive you for your sake because you ain't worth forgiving. Amen. We deserve hell. Amen. He forgave us for his son's sake. His son went to the cross, paid the price for us, died in our place, and because of that the Father forgives us on the basis of his son. Not on the basis of us. As I said before, you're not saved by the love of God. You're saved by the grace of God. And you get his love after you get saved, which he committed to you while you're yet a sinner. Okay. His pardon guarantees our security. Colossians 3 verse 13. Christ forgave you. That's past tense. 1 John 2 12. Your sins are forgiven you. Why? For his name's sake. Psalm 103, verse 3. God forgiveth all thine iniquities. I like Psalm 103. Go on down to verses 10 through 12. It talks about God having dealt with us according to our iniquities and according to our sins. If he did, he'd put us in hell and roast us forever. Amen. He doesn't deal with you if you receive his son according to your sins. He deals with you according to his grace and his mercy. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is, who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Who's a God like that? An Islamic God is not like that. Buddhist God is not like that. Catholic God is not like that. There's no God like the one in this Bible. Amen. It says he, he pardoned thine iniquity, and he'll save you, forgive you all of your sin, and then pass it by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. Once you are saved, and sin comes in your life, it's not that he overlooks it, but he won't allow that to keep you out of heaven. A lot of Christians die and go to heaven with sin on their conscience right then. Never dealt with it. Never got it forgiven all that. It'll be dealt with in the judgment seat of Christ, but they're still in heaven. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, they're saved, yet so is by fire. 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 3. And he says in chapter 5, uh, the, person, the person involved in sin in there, he said, uh, turn him over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh, yet his spirit should be saved in the last day. So that's, that's, uh, that's God passing by the transgression of the ribbon remnant not retaining his anger forever. Let me ask you a question. If God has forgiven you all of your iniquities, which he has if you're saved, right? Then what evidence is he going to call for in the court of heaven to condemn you? There's no evidence. Did God not say when he forgave you that he put your sins in the depths of the sea and then put them behind his back and then put them as far as the east is from the west, which is infinity, by the way? What evidence is he going to have? whatever. So, well, what if I die and I've sinned and I didn't confess it first time one night before I died and I stand before the Lord of the judgment seat of Christ? What's he going to do about it? I mean, there's it. No, no. It's a bad work. He deals with us at the judgment seat of Christ, first thing is on the basis of our works. And if you weren't in his will, that's a bad work, well, no matter what it was. And if you're in his will, that's a good work. You get rewarded for that and you lose rewards over the bad works. But he passes by the transgressions of remnant so you can go to heaven. That's the grace and mercy of God. Amen. Because we didn't deserve heaven before we got saved, and we don't deserve it since we got saved. Amen. It's all of him. Amen. So God the Father is very busy involved in salvation. Let me say secondly, the Father, not, not only did the Father plan salvation, but Jesus the Son provided that salvation. His death provided salvation. Romans 5, 8, Christ died for us. He became the author, the Bible says, of eternal salvation because he suffered and died in your place and in my place. And guess what? He's the only being in the universe who would do that for you. Amen. 
Not only does his death provide salvation, the resurrection of Christ guarantees our security in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6, he said, you're even now, right now, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, I don't see myself there. Well, God sees you there. It's a spiritual thing. Once you got saved, he puts you in Christ. You're seated at the right hand of the throne of God on high, the majesty on high, Hebrews 1 says. And that's where you are as far as God's concerned. And that's why you're, you're guaranteed to go to heaven when you die because you're already there as far as God's concerned. And whatever, he's, whatever he says is, is going to happen, it's going to happen. Amen. So he says, you believe in Jesus? then heaven will be your home for all eternity. And that's based on the resurrection of the Lord. He says in uh, Romans 4 verse 25, He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for what? Our justification. The only reason you're justified before God is because Jesus came out of that grave. I've been in that grave, by the way, and it's empty. Ain't nobody home. Wow, he's up there. 1 Peter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, your birth, born again, unto a lively hope by, you're begotten again by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. If he's still in the grave, 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection, the whole chapter. It talks about that. If Jesus is still in the grave, we're all men most miserable. I mean, we've got a dead God if that's the case. But he's not. It says in verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead uh, and become the first fruits of him that slept. So uh, thank God for his resurrection. That's what guarantees our, uh, our security in the Lord, our eternity with the Lord. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 17 through 20. I just hinted at that. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. It's worthless. You believe in the dead man, just like the Buddhists do. They believe in the dead man. Uh, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Not only that, but his ascension back to heaven to become our advocate guarantees our security. He says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, the temple down here, the tabernacle, is a picture of, of God's throne in heaven, but he's entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. He went back to heaven, not for himself, but for us. And verse 25 of that of chapter 7 of Hebrews, wherefore, because he's in the presence of God for us, wherefore he is able to also to save him unto the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You know what Jesus is doing right now? He's praying for you. Well, he can't pray for all the Christians in the world one time. Oh, yes, he can. He's God. He can certainly do that. He can be concerned with every one of us. He is concerned with every one of us every second of the day, watching out for his children. So he's able to save to the uttermost because he ever lived to make intercession for them. First John 2, verses 1 and 2, he says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. The word of God is written to tell us what sin is, tell us how to avoid it, all that. He said, I write this so that you won't sin. And if any man sin, if you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Hey. He, says, he says, if we sin, we have an advocate. What's an advocate? What's an advocate? Mediator. A mediator, okay, but more technically it's an attorney. It's a defense lawyer. That's what it is. And he says we have an advocate with the Father. Well, that goes back to what I read in Hebrews. Uh, he, he ever lived to make intercession for them. You know what our, our lawyer is doing? He's interceding to the judge of the whole universe and uh, pleading our case whenever we sin before God. The devil, uh, where is it? Micah, Micah chapter 3 gives an illustration of this, that uh, uh, the, the the child of God is standing before God in a place of judgment and the Lord is at the right hand and there stands the devil to accuse the child of God and he's standing there accusing him to God. We're told in Revelation 12 he's the accuser of the brethren. Night and day accuses us before God. You call that one of your kids? Look what he just did. And he accuses us before God but he, t he tells you in that illustration over there we're dealing with Joshua the high priest how that Jesus steps up when the devil said, devil accuses the child of God. Jesus steps up and says, hold on just a minute. That's one of mine. That is a brand plucked from the fire. Yeah. And I see no sin in him. Thank you. 
that as passing over the transgression we read a while ago. Amen. You've got two or three times in the Bible, uh, God talks about that, how he passes over the transgression of his children when they're accused by the wicked one. And the devil accuses them, and God says, I see no, I see no fault in them. I see no transgression in them. I see no sin in them. Well, he saw it. But he's going, to, he's going to take care of them when the enemy accuses them. And then God will deal with his children as a father does his children by chastening. The devil wants you in hell. But if you're saved, he can't get you there. He's going to hey, accuse you. Like, our advocate is going to stand up and say, this ain't going to work. You don't know what you're talking about. He basically tells the devil in, in Micah chapter 3, there, he says, shut your mouth. This is a brand plucked from the fire. He belongs to me. And then the blessing to go in the courtroom when... Uh, your elder brother is your defense attorney and the judge is your father. <laughs> I mean, what a deal. <laughs> Amen. He said that we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's the right one. Never makes a mistake. Shall not judge all the earth. The right. Yes, he will. We have an advocate and he's the propitiation. Ten cent word just means that he's the payment. He's the payment. So, when the devil accuses, the Lord tells uh, the judge there, he says, uh, his fine's been paid. I paid his fine. So, I don't owe, I don't owe anything. Mm -hmm. I don't owe a fine. Devil, if the devil accuses one of us who are saved unto, unto God, Jesus says, I paid their fine. They don't owe anything. Yeah. Amen. Hey, I mean, what, what a deal. How could you pass that up? Somebody came to you and said, hey, I'm going down to the bank to pay your mortgage off today. He said, I ain't nothing doing. I ain't taking your charity. Could we all call you a fool? Yeah. I mean, you want to pay off $40,000, dollars 200000 for somebody, I'd call you a fool if you accept it. That's right. Amen. That is providing them with no strings attached. Right. Yeah. Got to be careful about that. No strings attached to the payment the Lord made. Amen. He said, you, you take this, you take what I've done for you, it's a free gift. Those trains attached. Hey, thank you, Jesus. So Praise he's the propitiation. He's the payment. And notice what he said in that verse. He said he's the payment for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You realize the day is coming when the lost will stand before God. It's called the great white throne judgment in the Bible. And the Lord will prove to them, God will prove to them that he paid for their sins on Calvary as well as anybody else's. And the reason they're at that particular judgment is because they rejected that payment and God's going to judge them based on their life here and what they did. And then he's going to put them in a lake of fire where they're going to burn forever and ever. And based on their works in this life will determine the degree of hell that they have to experience for all eternity. I don't believe that. Well, that's your problem. You don't believe what God said. Amen. That's your problem. You better believe him. He's the one who created you. Amen. He's, uh, he paid for our sins, not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The payment of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, paying for our sins and taking our hell for us, is sufficient to atone for all the sins that are ever committed from Adam, the first man on the planet, to the last one who walks this earth. Every one of those sins. How could one man? He's God manifest in the flesh. Yes. He can yes. handle the job. Yes. I mean, anybody tells the sun when to rise can take care of everything else. Hey. Without any problem. So he's our advocate and paid for our sins and that guarantees our eternal salvation. He promised if he ascended back to heaven, which he did, he would send the Comforter called the Holy Spirit, which he did. John 16, verse 7. And he promised that that Spirit, when he came, would, quote, John 14, 16, abide with you forever. That's eternal security. If he's with you forever, I mean, let's face it, the Holy Spirit's not going to spend forever in hell. If he's in you forever, then you are saved forever. He seals, Ephesians 4.30 says he seals us. Once you accept the Lord as you're saved, he seals you unto the day of redemption. That's the second coming. And so we're secure because Jesus ascended back to heaven to be our advocate. And that means if you're saved, you can never be condemned for sin. Never. Romans 8.34. Who is he that condemneth? That's what Paul said. Who, who in the world is going to condemn a child of God? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ 
that died, yea, rather, and that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Second time he tells us he makes intercession for us. So who's going to condemn you? Jesus is there making intercession. Let them condemn, let them blow off steam, do all they're going to do. Jesus is there to uh, protect in the court of heaven. Amen. Not only that, his work as a shepherd guarantees our security. He'd be a lousy shepherd if he, if he let the little lambs get out there and get slaughtered by the wolf. Lousy shepherd. John 10, verses 27 28. We already, already read those. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. John 10, verse 11 says, Jesus is the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And you've all, we don't have shepherds around here, but you've all heard the stories how they put the sheep in the sheep coat at night, and the shepherd will lay across the gateway there, keep the wolf out, the bear out. All that kind of stuff. 23rd Psalm is about that. The Lord is my shepherd. And that psalm goes on to say, I will. The Lord is my shepherd. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. A couple of days? Amen. How about forever? Ever. Amen. Forever. So his work as a shepherd guarantees our security. All right, we talked about, about the Father, his part in salvation. We talked about, about the Son, his part in salvation. Now let's talk about the Holy Spirit. He's active in salvation as well. We talk about the whole Trinity involved. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the basis for our security. First, First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body, as a child of God, is the temple of the Spirit of God. Hey, He's in there. Body. He's living you. Right now. And that guarantees our security. He took up residence, and it's permanent. I uh, read the verse a while ago. Jesus said, I'll send the Comforter, and he'll be in you forever. Romans 8, verse 9, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. First John puts it very simple. He that hath, hath the Son hath life, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Amen. And over here saying the same thing, but it's talking about the, the Spirit instead of the Son. It says, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So if the Holy Spirit is not in you, you're not saved. So how do I know if he is or not? Well, you know if you got saved or not. That's how. Very simple. If you did what the Bible says to be saved, then you've got the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Ghost makes us secure. And he doesn't baptize anybody in the baptistry. He doesn't work with water. He is the water of life. John chapter yes, 7, amen. verses 38 and 39. He makes us secure. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, says uh, For we all have been baptized by one spirit into one body. So when you got saved, you see the Lord, you're saved, immediately that spiritual baptism takes place. You are immersed, which is what a baptism is, into the body of Jesus Christ. And there's no way out, by the way. Once you're in there, there's no way back out. So our bodies, be it his temple, uh, uh, he's taken up permanent residence, and that secures us, and his, him baptizing us into the body of Christ uh, makes us secure there, and that is eternal as well, permanently in the body of Jesus Christ. Um, he said Ephesians 5.30, when that happens, he said he makes us, the members of Christ's body, we're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So it's more than just he puts you in a bag or something. It's, well, you, you're his body. You make up the bones of the flesh of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, there's no blood in that body. There's no blood. And your resurrection body won't have any blood in it either because it won't be. What, what is it that keeps the flesh alive? The blood. The blood. And there won't be any. It's a spiritual body. First Corinthians chapter 15. So his baptism makes us secure. His sealing of us makes us secure. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, in whom you also trusted in Jesus. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you heard the gospel, believed it, you trusted the Lord. In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You were sealed. All you ladies know what that means, right? Well, maybe you don't. Very few people do canning anymore, but some of you still do. Uh, you listen for that little top to go, right? He's a sealed. And it's secure until somebody pops the seal, pops the top off of it. And that's the picture given there in Ephesians 
uh, chapter 1, where the Holy Spirit seals us. He puts you in the jar of heaven, we might say, seals you in there, and uh, nothing gets in and nothing gets out. And uh, it which has begun a good work will perform until the day of Jesus Christ. You're sealed to the day of redemption, that is, till you get your, your body and so on and so forth. And so you're sealed, you're secure forever because of the sealing of the Holy Spirit. My wife has a jar of some kind of jam or something other, and that jar is probably 50 years old. Her aunt put it up 100 years ago, and we still got it. It's never been opened. But I guarantee if we opened it, we could flop it on a biscuit and it'd be good. <laughs> Am I right, ladies? It's sealed for good, right? Is that not true? Sure. Sure it is. And yeah, I know what y'all are thinking. Some food loses its value over time. I understand all this stuff. It's still good. You could eat it out of there. With the seal for the seal right. No air, nothing, no germs, nothing can get inside of it. That's what the Lord's done for us. You're sealed. And he did it right, by the way. You're sealed forever. The top has been popped, and you ain't coming out of there until it gets popped off. And it's just like a letter. What do you do with a letter? You seal the envelope, right? You seal it. <coughs> Shut it tight. Why not? So nobody can get in it but the recipient. That's where it's supposed to work. And so when it gets to the other end for the post office, wherever it's going, whoever gets here is addressed to breaks the seal. Well, you are addressed to heaven. You are addressed to God the Father. Amen. And that's where you're going. And the envelope is not going to be opened until you get there. You seal us. Amen. The Spirit's intercession, just like the intercession of the Son, our advocate, the Spirit intercedes for us too, and that keeps us secure. Romans 8, verses 26 and 27, he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Thank God for that. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. And then the truth, sometimes you get down and pray, and you don't know, what to, you know how to pray for a situation. You know what to pray for. I mean, what does Lindsay know what to pray for this morning for her son? She doesn't even know what the situation really is. But listen to what he says. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, just like Jesus does, with groanings which cannot be uttered. There goes tongues out the window. You can't speak a heavenly language if your life depended on it. Uh, with groanings which cannot be uttered, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he, the Spirit, maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I don't know the will of God maybe in a given situation, but the Holy Spirit does it. He's living inside, and he intercedes according to the will of God. Didn't, didn't the Bible say, if you ask anything according to my will, I'll give it to you? Amen. According to my will. Well, I don't always know what his will is, but the Holy Spirit does. So, I'm, I'm down here. I've got the Holy Spirit living inside. He's interceding for me, and Jesus is up there next to the throne of the majesty on high, and he's interceding for me. And you have a perfect picture of that in Exodus chapter 17 with Moses up on the mountain looking down at Joshua, type of Jesus Christ, defeating Amalek, a type of flesh. And when Moses gets tired and lets his arms down, uh, Amalek is winning the battle over Joshua. And so Aaron and Hur get on either side of him and hold his arms up to the going down of the sun. And Joshua wins the battle and defeats Amalek. So Jesus defeats our flesh because our arms are being held up with uh, Jesus Christ on one side, our high priest Aaron, and God, the Spirit on the other side, her light on the other side, holding us up before God, and we win the battle. Yes, yes. Thank you. you can win any spiritual battle that comes your way if you'll just rest in the Lord. Amen. Any of them. You don't have to get depressed, you don't have to have the money grubs, you don't have to be under the circumstances. You don't, have to, you don't have to yield. I didn't say you wouldn't have problems. I said you don't have to yield to those problems. Yeah. Why? With the advocates we have, come on. Jesus on one side holding you up and the Holy Spirit on the other side holding you up. How did you fall down? And that's what he says. That's what he says in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, you do this, 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 add to your faith, virtue and this, that, and all these kind of things, and you get to the top of that thing, which is charity, and you'll be perfect, and ye shall never fall. What's he talking about? Backsliding. Backsliding. That's why Jesus says, pray that you enter not into temptation. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we got these advocates that are holding us before the Lord, and we're secure. We're secure. If you fall on your face, it's your fault. It's 
It's not the Lord's fault. He's doing everything He can to keep you upright. Amen. Yeah. And He can do it if you'll, if you'll uh, cooperate with Him. That's all it takes, a little cooperation. So the Spirit's intercession keeps us secure as well. Romans 8, verses 16 and 17, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Boy, isn't that a blessing? When everything's falling in around you and your whole your little world's falling apart and all that stuff, isn't it a blessing for God just to whisper, that's okay, you belong to me. Amen. You're still my child. Amen. It's going to be all right in the end. And it is. I'll read the last chapter. So he goes on and says, If children and heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also reign with him. I don't know about you, but I want to do the reign. I don't want to be somebody's water boy during the kingdom. I want somebody to be my water boy. Amen. But in order to reign with him, I've got to pick up my cross daily. Suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Bear my cross daily, bear the reproach of Christ daily, and uh, so that I can be a joint heir with him. We've got joint heirs with Christ. God's mark is on you if you are saved. Uh, I've been going through Ezekiel the last couple days in my personal devotions, and over there in chapter. Uh, might be 17, I think, somewhere in there. He takes a man with an ink horn and runs him through Jerusalem and puts a mark on all those that are right with God. The rest of them get killed. It's talking about the Babylonian captivity is what's really meant to. He puts a mark, the mark of their God. You read Revelation, you read the tribulation, those sealed Jews, the mark of their God is on them. And you got one too. So I don't see it, but the Holy Spirit sees it. Yeah, He's the one to put it there. And so his mark is on you if you're saved. You're his, and he's yours. He's ours. We're his. And the moment you accepted Christ as your Savior, you became a new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. All things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. So, well, I don't feel like a new creature. That's got nothing to do with anything. If you, from your heart, repent of your sin, see Christ as your Savior, you became a new creature in Christ. And as far as God's concerned, that was your birthday. Nothing before salvation even counted in the economy of God. Amen. All, it's just all <coughs> hotter and hotter. That's all it's for. But once you receive Him, from that point on, God recognizes your life, He blesses your life, you're a new creature in Christ. Look at uh, 1 John chapter 5. And we'll close with this passage. 1 John chapter 5. I'm talking about the Trinity's involvement in salvation. 1 John chapter 5, verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, which we do, the witness of God is greater. If you don't believe men, why in the world would you believe God? For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Well, that's the Holy Spirit, John chapter 16. He that believeth not God hath made him, made God, a liar, because he believes not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. You're not going to find it anywhere else. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. He's talking about eternal life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know salvation. Christianity is a no soul religion, not a guesswork, not hope I hold out to the end. No, you can know for sure that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Our, our, our salvation is eternally secure in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How in the world could you be a deal like that? Yeah. Father, we thank you, God, for, for, for the fact that, well, first of all, the fact that you died to pay for our sins. God manifested the flesh as he died for us and raised again for our justification. But we thank you uh, for the fact also that anybody who will receive Jesus as Savior you guarantee that you'll save that person forever and ever. They'll never lose it. Never have to face hell. Though many, many will wind up in hell. 
Lord, we know that some people believe everybody gets saved in the end. That's contrary to the scriptures. We know that some people think they get saved after death as a second chance. That's contrary to the scriptures. We know that some people don't even believe there is a God. And that's certainly contrary to the scriptures. In fact, it's it's just asinine to believe that uh, we came from a, a blob of nothing descended from monkeys and that takes more faith than believing that God created us. Lord, I pray you touch our hearts, help us to realize we were saved with this great security that we have. Nothing can change it. Nothing can take it away. Nothing can destroy that salvation because of you. What's our God doeth? 1 Samuel 3 verse 14 says, What's our God doeth? It shall be forever. No man can put anything to it. No man can take anything from it. So if we're saved, we're in the hand of the Lord. Nothing can pluck us out of His hand. God, if anybody here is not saved, may they realize how serious this is. It determines where they spend eternity, whether they believe in it or not. And God, I pray you speak to our hearts. Save your loss, whatever you want us to know this morning in Jesus' name. Take your hands back in just a moment. If the Lord spoke to anyone, save your loss. Now's the time to do something about it. Someone says, God never called me. Well, that's what I've been doing the last 40 minutes. So you're not God, nobody speaks to me called me. That's what a witness for the Lord is, is God calling somebody.